Good morning, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be here and to welcome our panelists who are going to be participating in the symposium this morning, uh, community guests, uh, faculty, and of course, students. Uh, I always look forward this time of year to two things, springtime and windows on the world. Uh, walking over here this morning, Ah, springtime has let me down. It feels more like winter than spring out there, but I know the Windows on the World Symposium will not let me down. Uh, this is a great opportunity every year for us to focus on uh, global issues that are of importance to our students, Cookville, the state, and the region. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what the panelists have to say, and of course, your questions. So, uh, again, I want to welcome everybody here. Uh, I'm the the president uh, for Tennessee Tech, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. DeFurio. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Uh, today we're going to be talking about global issues in healthcare. So I'm going to go ahead and start introducing our, our wonderful panel. It's quite impressive. So I'll do them in order of the way they're going to speak. So our first speaker is going to be Gail Stedman. She's an emeritus faculty in the TTU School of Nursing. She is a nurse practitioner with the Putnam County Health Department. Her international work experience includes working with the Clinton Health Access Initiative, the Foundation Ministry of Health in Rwanda, the World Health Organization, and the Peace Corps. And following her is going to be uh, Dr. Charles Womack. He received a medical degree from Tulane University School of Medicine. His affiliation with the Cookville Regional Medical Center goes from 1975 to 2013. He has served or is serving as Chief of Staff, Cookville Regional Medical Center, President of the Putnam County Medical Center, the Mayor of Cookville, President of Cookville Noon Rotary Club, Chairman of the Board of Tennessee Medical Association, and he was also a recipient of the Mandela Award for Windows on the World. Our third speaker is going to be Dr. Melissa Geist. She's a professor in the Whitson Hester School of Nursing. A passionate academic researcher, author, and practitioner, Dr. Geist is a certified nurse educator with a history of excellence in teaching practice and practice. She maintains dual national certification as a family and pediatric nurse practitioner. Her current interest is in cross-disciplinary teamwork and communication. She has planned study abroad experiences with students and faculty from nursing, agriculture, foreign languages, and engineering. Over the past few years, Dr. Geist has focused on water, sanitation, and health issues in the marginalized Toledo district of Belize. And our final uh, speaker is going to be Dr. Mark Pierce. He's an infectious disease consultant at Cookville Regional Medical Center. He provides inpatient and outpatient consulting services and directs a travel clinic. He has extensive clinical experience caring for patients in all types of all types in the U.S. and Africa. In the U.S., he worked in academic and community-based hospitals, seeing primarily adult infectious disease cases. In Africa, Dr. Pierce ran a medical ward in a large city hospital and then worked in a bush hospital for five years. Dr. Pierce also founded and directed the Vanderbilt Infectious Disease Clinic, and he received his medical degree from Southern Illinois University School of Medicine in 1980. So I'm going to go ahead for time purposes. Everybody's got about eight minutes to speak and let them go ahead and... Uh, and give their uh, information. So I'll pass it off to uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here and um, and to be with them of this group. Thank you. And thank you, Tennessee Tech, for hosting Windows on the World because it really is a, um, a wonderful, and it's grown into even more of a, of a great experience. Um, so my experience has been working um, in healthcare um, as a nurse, as a nurse practitioner, as an educator in different parts of the world. But today I thought if we could just look briefly at the, um, the concept of global health and answer some questions. Um, yes, these are the ones we're looking at. What, why, how, and who. Um, and this shows you the global issues including the waiting room of an emergency room in uh, the United States, yeah. So this definition actually has turned into 
somewhat of a controversy as global health has grown into a discipline, not only as um, something in public health, but something in medical schools and nursing schools across a lot of different disciplines. So, the high, and so looking for a definition that fits everybody is, is quite challenging. The one that is used most often is the one I cited here. And, and I've highlighted a few of the pieces of it, and obviously it's not the entire definition, but it's looking at health improvement. Equity is a big word here, as well as interdisciplinary collaboration. Yeah. So I think most of you are here today, and you probably already know why this is important. And I think it's, it's been caused, because we've talked about it as international health, we've talked about it as um, all kinds of different ways of approaching it. But the problems that it encompasses are tremendous. And we know from an ethical humanitarian standpoint, it's, it's a really important way to view healthcare and view the world. However, there's also issues of the boundaries are gone. And we know that from Zika, we know that from Ebola, we can name literally hundreds of infectious diseases that can be at our doorstep in one flight. So that's really important. And the impact it has on our healthcare system here, if you look at it from a US perspective. Economically, socially, enormous in terms of development. And I would add this, not just in lesser developed or lesser resource countries, but also in the United States. The political stability is huge here, as well as security and freedom. And I mention freedom because I say, you think about some of the healthcare workers that went to Liberia to offer services and how their freedoms were curtailed when they returned. So it, it becomes a huge issue of security. Yeah. So what are the issues? Now, I've, I have a running list there, and you could probably add 10 more things to this list. And it, it sounds really depressing and, and gloomy when you, when you look at all the, the problems that are out there. And if you Google global health issues in 2016, you'll see a, a myriad of, of perspectives here. So these are just some of them. I won't bore you with reading them, but I will say one of the underlying pieces of this is that health care um, is actually a right. And I quoted Paul Farmer here. He's a physician who started Partners in Health. He's out of Harvard. He's an anthropologist and a, a doctor. He does a lot of work internationally. And this is the quote that he came up with um, several years ago. And I think that's one of the things that we're grappling with in this country. Um, is healthcare a right or a privilege? And that's going on all over the world. Yeah. Okay, so one of the questions that we have as Americans sitting in the university with a lot of education is how do you deal with these issues? Because they are very complicated and multi-layered. So I am presenting to you this parable about the river. And a lot of you probably already know this. It's three friends are walking along. It's, it's a very old story. Um, along the river, just talking, enjoying their day, shocked to find out when they look at the river, bodies are floating by. They jump in the river, as they would, any, anybody would, they, they were absolutely upset. They jump in the river and they start to save the bodies. They pull them out, they pull them to the shore, they resuscitate them, they do everything they can. To their horror, more and more bodies keep coming down. They continually try to save the lives of these people. <coughs> Meanwhile, one of the people in this group of three says, you know what, we need to go up and find out why people are falling into this river? What is happening at the other end of this river? The other two people are upset because we have to deal with this problem. These people will die if we don't do it. So this is kind of the whole idea of upstream, downstream approach to how we deal with health problems. And in public health, we try to do preventative pieces to this. This does not negate the idea that you don't save lives. You know, our medical model in the United States for a long time has been focused on that. You build a big hospital right there at the bottom of the river so we can save these people as they come down. So the story that fits this probably most perfectly in the last year is the Ebola crisis, um, which if you think about it, 
we had the obligation to do everything we could to save lives in that experience. People were dying at unconscionable levels, you know, and we sent people over, we had the healthcare teams there at a huge risk to their own lives to take care of them. It was extremely important. But when we look upriver, what we see is um, the problems have to do with the conflict that was going on there and the systems that don't exist. Um, I put this up because it's kind of put in perspective the size of Africa and the amount and where Ebola was in this last outbreak. Um, this is a kind of busy slide, but, the, but really the issue here is to compare the physicians per 100,000 and nurses in these other countries, leading us to look at what happened in that system that would allow this problem to get to the point that it did, where people died so quickly without any help. And if you look at um, Liberia, it actually mirrors Tennessee in terms of size. And again, the point of this slide, if you look at the physicians, numbers in the entire country at the time when the outbreak occurred was 50. Now several physicians lost their lives in the outbreak. Comparing that to Tennessee where we have 17 plus thousand. Nurses the same thing, infant mortality, unemployment, and life expectancy. So this is the upstream look at the system that was or actually lack of system in this crisis. Yeah. So this is Tolstoy. <laughs> the next question is, how do we go about dealing with these issues? And I think all of us have, anybody that's in this room, you're here for a reason, you're interested in this, and it becomes extremely complicated in the way in which we approach it. And one of the first concepts that I've listed here um, is cultural humility. And anybody that goes overseas, I, I urge the people at Tech to do this, and people are doing it all the time when we look at Dr. Guy's several other faculty. The experience that occurs from this is lifelong changing. I disagree with Tolstoy on that part, because you really do see people change. The research shows when medical students and nursing students do this kind of work, it changes the trajectory of their career. They become much more involved in underserved areas. They consider primary um, provider status rather than specialty. It has really made a difference there. But I'm looking at this as cultural humility is the idea that you not only have cultural competence, you know the language, you have an idea what the culture's like, but you're also introspectively focusing on the other. You're actually asking this person, this community, what is it they need? Because trust me, they will tell you. And it's really hard sometimes for us to do that. Because the reason you're here right now is because you've been assertive, you've come up with great ideas, you've been extremely disciplined, and you have been rewarded for all of that. Now we're asking you to go someplace and swallow that and find out what is it these people this community, this particular population, wants, needs, feels. It requires a great deal of humility and a lot of introspection. But it does lead, hopefully, to a solidarity, which is more the idea of interdependence. And one of the ideas of that, I would say to Tech, is reaching out to international professionals to come here for education. We go there for exchanges, we don't speak their languages half the time. We require they speak English and then have the patience to work with them to create a professional group that's going to be staying there, whether it's an academic, whether it's a physician, a nurse, any of those. And then, by the way, again, this is totally interdisciplinary. When you go to the top of the river, you're going to find that you're going to need engineers, you're going to need mathematicians, you're going to need farmers, agriculturalists, veterinarians, it's, it's incredibly important to have that approach as well. And then lastly, hopefully it will lead to sustainability. So those are the questions I would promote if you are looking at working overseas. Um, the agencies I've listed there, um, there are so many 
agencies within the non-governmental now, uh, faith-based as well as um, contract workers, any of that is available. Yeah. So I leave you with this last slide. Um, again, Paul Farmer about um, how we view lives and what matters. And um, thank you. <coughs> I've got some views of an older physician. Um, I'm older than probably most anybody here, and well, maybe one other person or two other people might be a little older than I am here. But um, I can re remember getting mumps and measles and chicken pox as a child, and we've got all these wonderful things to uh, prevent infectious disease. And I'm going to give kind of a, a little talk, uh, kind of a metaphor of Zika. Uh, in relating to social media media and online publishing, which is uh, becoming uh, prevalent right now. Uh, Dr. Pierce is going to give a more in-depth uh, talk about Zika, and we discovered that after we're here. Fortunately, our data matches, so we won't be giving you any false information. But uh, uh, in 1947, Zika was first identified in Uganda and uh, isolated out of monkeys, and nobody thought much of it. Uh, there was an outbreak in 2007. It was still under the radar. It was still under the radar in, on Gap Island in the Pacific, and then it really started uh, becoming more prevalent. Uh, 28,000 people were infected in French Polynesia, and that started hitting the radar of medical uh, infectious disease and specialists. Next, please. Uh, the symptoms, it, it, if you're not pregnant, it's a very uh, mild disease for the most part. Uh, you can have some fever, uh, rash, joint pain. Uh, there are cases of Guillain-Barre, which happens with a lot of viral illnesses, which is a, a neurological condition of muscular weakness. But the thing that, uh, that's got everyone concerned is the microcephaly associated uh, and with pregnancy. This was in uh, 2013. Well, in 2015, there was an outbreak. Next slide. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, it's transmitted by mosquitoes, uh, Aedes mosquitoes, and um, it can be tr uh, transmitted uh, by body fluids for at least two weeks, probably longer, uh, after infection. It's a transient thing, you have it, you ache, have some fever, and it's over for most people unless you're pregnant. Next. It gets worse. Brazil, last year in 2015, they had an outbreak. 1.4 million were estimated to be infected uh, by the Zika virus. And 3,500 cases before the end of the year, and then now it's gone up more than that. Um, and that's caused a lot of concern, obviously. It's a health emergency. The pandemic uh, levels in all of Latin America, South America, uh, and so it's become somewhat of an emergency. Next. Uh, the World Health Organization has declared an emergency of international concern on the first day of February. The first day of February wasn't that far back. So what's happened uh, as far as online publishing and social media? Next. For, uh, the emergency was declared on February the 1st. February the 10th, 10 days later, just recently, uh, uh, funders, scientific academies, and journals urge that people cooperate by putting their data in, out on the internet in real time. So that's where you, you people come in. Y'all are all used to uh, Snapchat and uh, I'm used to Facebook, but y'all have got other things that uh, <laughs> but to be on real time uh, that, you know, and have your information for people to do scientific research, do their data, uh, go next. Uh, University of Wisconsin started posting its experiments with uh, transmission and levels of virus daily online to have that available for other researchers to use in their research so they not go into any blind alleys 
and be able to use it on a daily basis. So that's revolutionary because people do their experiments, they keep it as proprietary. They keep it to themselves. Uh, go next. This is what a normal biological research paper has done. So uh, most of y'all are business or economic majors, but you, you do experiments, you have a hypothesis, you collect data, you write a paper, you submit it to a journal, and then peer review. Peer review is the uh, thing that uh, really uh, keeps something like uh, uh, this uh, uh, autism with the vaccines. There, there was not proper peer review when Wakesman uh, did his research that was in Lancet and had to be retracted. So you have to have rigorous peer review to make sure articles are pertinent and uh, a, a paper is finally published and it may have revisions, they may tell you to do further experiments, and, and it may not be published, and it may take several months to years, but we're here in the middle of an emergency. Uh, uh, 4,000 babies have been born with microcephaly. We've got to get something out to try to prevent this tragedy from developing and getting worse, and so that's why online preprints, that's why online data is very important, and that's why things have broken, and they're wanting to get it out on the internet. Next, uh, this is what what happens if you if you don't get your data out, people are left in the dark, and time and money are wasted. Next, so preprints are coming out in the scientific literature right now. Uh, it's uh, published immediately. Later, there's peer review, and people vet these things online to make sure that there's not a fraud like the autism and the vaccine thing is. Nature, which is a prestigious journal, science allowed this. However, there's some Luddites, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of the American Medical Association, they've been very restrictive. If you don't uh, publish it in their uh, magazine, it's a prestigious magazine, they don't allow this. Next. Uh, this is the, relates to the profusion of scientific papers since 2000. I've got my era uh, on 2005 when there were about 1.5 million papers. This is engineering papers. This is millions of engineering, scientific, and uh, papers that are published. That's an information overload that really hits us. And so we've got to get the data out, and if you put it in a peer-reviewed journal, things can slow down. So, next. So uh, in San Francisco back in 2012, uh, they uh, stated that research should be assessed on its own merits rather than on the basis of the journal, such as New England Journal or uh, in Science or whatever, in which the research is published. Next. So preprints, which is what I'm talking about, online publishing, data available right away, can save time and money, it can accelerate discoveries in something such as Ebola or Zika, and it can break the stranglehold on elite journals, and it can save lives. So scientists are discovering what uh, students have already figured out about social media, that uh, you need to be online right away and get your data out, and it can uh, make a difference in something as an emergency such as Zika or Ebola. Thank you. Thank you to, um, to the, school, the College of Business and the Tennessee Tech, and of course, um, my colleagues um, who bring a wealth of experience. I have uh, just a little bit of a different um, slant, which is the beauty of a panel like this. And so I imagine that a lot of you, when you um, think about global health, there's certain things that pop into your mind. And so the three things I want to really uh, point out is one, Global health is not just international health, and I think everybody has, um, has touched on that. It is, it, it's much more than just what's happening in Africa or South America. It's not conspicuously health. It's not always about um, a, a um, obviously health-related topic. And um, if you're going to do it, please do your research and do it right. Um, and so um, I imagine you guys think global health or you think um, um, 
international. This is what you're picturing, right? Um, it's somebody, we are going into an underserved area, and um, we are providing um, some kind of service. And that certainly has that aspect to it. And so uh, this uh, group of pictures is from one of my first trips to the Toledo District in Belize. And we were down there training the Ministry of Health appointed healthcare workers. There's one in every village, no matter how big or how small. And um, they, they receive very little training for what they are asked to do. And so it's uh, what uh, Gail Stearman had uh, said as well, that it's, um, if we can train the people who are there, who are living in the village day in and day out, that is so much better than a one-stop, um, you know, hit them and leave kind of um, experience. And so, so this is probably what you're kind of thinking about. My argument <coughs> is, um, you go. it's, it's much more than that. I mean, you've heard um, about Zika. There was just the remote area medical clinic right here in Cookville where hundreds, if not, uh, yeah, <laughs> were, um, were served because they don't have access to health care. They don't have access to basic medical health and dental care right here in the United States. So it is not just going overseas. If you want to participate in global health care, let's start here. <laughs> because what you do here affects what happens out there. Um, it's also not conspicuously health. And so um, our projects in Belize are water sanitation health. Um, I always tell my students who I'm recruiting to go to Belize with me, in the upper left-hand corner is a toilet. So, and what I tell my students is, you're lucky if that was your toilet. Because for most of my students, I'll just, I'm a nurse, so I just kind of let things say, like they just come out, um, you're pooping in the woods. So you're finding a tree, and that's where you're going to the bathroom. Uh, because the, the village where, where we um, go, they don't have basic sanitation facilities. So you're lucky if that's yours. And so uh, this is a true story, I'll tell you very quickly. I am, um, yes, pooping in the woods, and um, a pig knocks me over. I am not kidding, that's a true story. So, you know, the, the, the lack of access, right, to a bathroom. The, the issues with that is, you go in the woods, people go walk through what you've just done in the woods, and then they track it into their huts. And so the diarrheal illness and the, and the problems that uh, go with that. Um, that is uh, a group of Tennessee Tech students doing a beach uh, cleanup at the Barrier Reef. Water access to clean water, to water that doesn't have medical waste and styrofoam and all that stuff in it. We picked up at least 12 contractor bags of trash, and we, we didn't touch the, the surface. And it's a beautiful barrier reef. Um, uh, the students in the, um, in below are looking at um, different types of plants that can provide mostly protein. Protein malnutrition is a big issue in the villages um, where we go. So there are some um, research personnel from the University of Belize that we partner with who are looking at plant-based um, sources for protein that are indigenous. We're not going to come and, and um, you know, plant a, a plant that's going to um, spread and, and go crazy like what, what's the one that's all over our hills now? Katsu! <laughs> So, right, we need indigenous uh, sources. So actually, our, those are nursing students who are um, in this area and looking at things like star fruit, avocado, um, moringa, um, <laughs> different plant sources that we can maybe take out to the villages. Um, and last but not least is, um, is a, my students who are washing their clothes in the river <laughs> because that is where you have to wash your clothes, but um, we, we learned a lot from the villagers about um, what you can, 
what's the best way to wash your clothes in terms of being sustainable? Uh, we don't need to be taking our chemical laden shampoos and things down there um, and putting it in a river. So, um, <coughs> so my big take home point to you is if you are thinking about going on a mission trip for whoever is sponsoring it, do your homework. And I want you to really think, are you doing something, are you doing it to the community? Are you doing it for the community? Are you doing it with the community? And obviously, the thing here is, these need to be done with the community. And I will give you two um, examples. The pill bottle is up there because the very first time that I went um, to Belize, somebody had been there before us. And they handed out metformin, which is a pill for diabetes, and lisinopril, which is a pill for blood pressure. They handed out lots of it. Now, do the people in that village uh, need that? Yeah. Type 2 diabetes and blood pressure um, hypertension is rampant because they have a corn-based carb diet. However, there was no way to sustain those medications. So when I got there and the medications had just run out, they were all rebounding. So all of these people who had been on metformin for a max of maybe four weeks, all of a sudden they didn't have it anymore. And so we were seeing effects of now they don't have the medications. So here's my picture. These people are back in the United States with their matching t-shirts, patting themselves on the back because they handed out a lot of medications. If, if they could go back and see what I saw, maybe they wouldn't have that, um, gosh, I did great kind of feeling, right? Here's my second one. That is an actual playground that's in a village called Odosha in uh, Belize. That, that playground is probably a $15,000 playground. There is never a child on that playground, ever. Because you know what? They don't play on playgrounds. They play in the bush and they're in the rivers and they're, they, this is, somebody did this to the community. It was, it was not asked for. And again, somebody is back home, right, saying, we built this playground and it was great. But what could have that that funding accomplished. We're going to go down and build latrines. Urine diverted, desiccating latrines. It's not glamorous and it's not sexy and I'm not going to put it on a t-shirt, although maybe I will. <laughs> but it's what that community wanted. They're running out of bush. The village is growing. They can't go in the woods without their neighbor walking by them or getting knocked over by a pig. What they want is latrines, and it'll change their health trajectory. That's what we're doing. So I just challenge you to think about that. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to the College of Business for the, uh, the invitation. And uh, we'd just like to give you an example that since the topic is global health, about how one uh, global health threat or how one health threat in an isolated area can soon become a global problem because of not only transfer, not only travel of people, but also travel of pathogens as well. I want to credit Dr. Moncayo from the Tennessee Public Health, uh, Tennessee Department of Health for these slides. Uh, so Zika virus, which everybody's heard about, it's a single-stranded RNA virus from the Flavi virus family. And that that's closely related to a number of uh, viruses that we don't see commonly here, but are huge problems worldwide. Uh, West Nile, we've all heard of, it's a flavy virus. Remember these, and Japanese encephalitis, yellow fever, dengue. Uh, the last two, Japanese encephalitis, West Nile viruses, they have neurotropism, which means that they go to the CNS, the central nervous system, as we'll see that this one does as well. This virus is predominantly transmitted by mosquito bites. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'd like to kind of give you an idea of where it started. As uh, Dr. Womack mentioned, it was isolated first in Uganda in a rhesus monkey in 1947 in a forest named Zika uh, in that area of Uganda. It wasn't recognized as a human pathogen then, and the first reported human case was actually in Nigeria in 1954. 
and there have only been 14 documented cases of Zika from Africa. There have undoubtedly been millions more, but because of the health uh, resources and investigation, etc., uh, there's only been 14 documented cases. Uh, it, it's, it's spread by, uh, you know, pathogens have a particular way that they live and a particular way that they spread, and this is spread by an AIDS mosquito, which is that one particular species, and uh, they have that very commonly in Africa. Next slide, please. Uh, it was first recognized as a large outbreak in the Yap Islands in Micronesia. It spread from Africa, kind of across Asia silently, entered those Pacific Islands. And uh, what was amazing about it, this was a small outbreak just because there are not many people there. There was a 73% attack rate. In other words, the entire population, 73% of them became infected. Now, only one in five people who become infected become symptomatic. So, and so this was at 18 percent, so it's roughly 18 to 25 percent become symptomatic. But two-thirds, over two-thirds of the entire population, 6,700 people lived there, 5,000 of them actually became infected with this. Uh, next slide, please. It wasn't recognized uh, that there was a neurotropism at that time. It wasn't recognized that there was microcephaly at that time either. Now, these are the main symptoms, as Dr. Wank mentioned. It causes flu-like syndrome. You get a rash, you get fever, you get joint pains, and then you get a non purulent conjunctivitis. You get red eyes from it uh, in the majority of the time. And for most people, it occurs a few days after you're infected. It lasts for two to seven days, and it goes away. Then you're immune for life, so it's no big deal. Next slide, please. Uh, it spread then across more Pacific islands and ended up on uh, this outbreak in French Polynesia. Next slide, please. Uh, which was the largest outbreak ever seen, 28,000 symptomatic people, 140,000 estimated attack rate. Again, 66% of that population was infected. Huge problem. And at this time, they did begin to realize the neurotropism because they saw an association with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Next slide, please. So, uh, Guillain so again, most of the time it was a self-limiting disease, but 70 were hospitalized, 42 with Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre is a disease that affects the myelin sheath, it causes paralysis, and uh, we've seen it with a number of other viral illnesses, and there was a you know, big scare here with the swine flu back in the 1970s from Guillain-Barre. But again, uh, microcephaly wasn't recognized. When they went back retrospectively and looked at this large outbreak, they did find some excess cases of microcephaly that had not been associated with the virus. Next slide, please. Uh, this, so this is a schematic that just kind of shows where it spread. It began in, number one, in Africa, Uganda, was first human case, was in Nigeria, kind of spread across Asia, uh, and then hit those Pacific Islands and marched across to the Americas in that uh, big outbreak in 2013 in French Polynesia. I find this very interesting. It probably entered Brazil sometime late 2013, early 2014. Next slide, please. And uh, what really made everybody uh, understand how serious it was was the excess number of cases of microcephaly that they began seeing in Brazil. You know, microcephaly is a uh, it's a congenital birth defect that's caused by a number of different things, and there's a kind of a baseline, very low rate of that in every country. And this shows what the number of cases of, micro, of microcephaly in Brazil from 2010 through 2015, roughly 150 cases per year. And then bang, look at 2015, 4,000 cases, 4,000 excess cases of microcephaly. That's a huge public health problem. Next slide, please. So you see this little guy has microcephaly. The problem with microcephaly is not just a small head, but there's also significant cognitive defects, significant uh, neural development defects. Also, as they began looking at this, they found that there's an increase in fetal loss and an increase in ocular problems. So it is a huge problem for a woman who becomes infected during her pregnancy. And again, that's important. A woman who has been infected before and is now immune, it's no problem for her to get pregnant. Uh, but it's infection during pregnancy. And it looks like there's probably some problem from all, uh, from any trimester of pregnancy, but certainly the first trimester where organogenesis is going on is, the, is clearly the worst. So WHO declared it a public health emergency as noted in uh, February 2016. Next slide, please. Uh, again, transmission of Zika virus is almost, is almost exclusively through uh, mosquito bites. And, uh, and so every place that has this particular AIDS type, AIDS aegypti, or AIDS aegypti, or other type of AIDS spe subspecies, uh, mosquitoes can develop uh, problems if the virus gets into that population. 
And, uh, but then there also, it's been also found in, in blood, urine, semen. Uh, there are cases of sexual transmission. There was a case documented in Texas where a man who had been, uh, I think in Mexico, had acquired the virus, came back and gave it to a woman who had never traveled uh, through sexual contact. Uh, it also can be found in blood and body fluid, or yeah, blood and body fluids. So blood products is a possibility of transmission as well. It's also found in breast milk, although there's been no documented transmission, there probably is some transmission that occurs that way. Next slide, please. Uh, so epidemiologic leakages, uh, travel to a country or region with known Zika transmission would put you at risk. Sexual contact with a laboratory confirmed case. This is how we kind of look at it here. Recipient of blood or blood products, organ transplant recipient, association in time and place with a case, or uh, pregnancy with a paternal epidemiologic link. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is what the uh, CDC recommends. Pregnant women should not travel to Zika infected areas. And if you're uh, if you're going to go on one of Dr. Guy's uh, mission trips and you're going to the Caribbean, then uh, don't go if you're pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant. If you're a man and you go, uh, if you get sick, you'll just have a very mild illness. But when you come back, uh, you might carry that virus in your semen for. It's been demonstrated for at least two months, and the recommendations are probably for six months you should abstain from uh, unprotected sex to not pass that to a woman who might become pregnant. Uh, symptomatic individuals should avoid mosquitoes for at least a week. That's because you don't want, if, you're, if you go somewhere and you get that illness, you come back, you're symptomatic. Uh, if you get mosquito bites, then that mosquito then can transmit to someone else. So that's the reason for that. Uh, and then people with tra without travel history who have epidemiologic linkage should, should see their doctor if you're sick. That's fine, but the, honest, the, the most important thing is to avoid mosquitoes because if you're sick from it, there's no treatment for Zika virus. It's symptomatic treatment. And, uh, you know, the vast majority of people will not have any illness from it. I mean, they won't have any significant illness from it. They'll just have, again, flu-like syndrome that will resolve. Next slide, please. And uh, there have been no U U.S. cases. Uh, all the cases in the U.S. have been imported. Someone who's gone somewhere else and got it, except for that transmission in Texas. Uh, but it will come here, there's no question. It's been in Mexico. This is the range of AIDS mosquitoes that we have in the U.S. And you see the southern U.S., uh, we have AIDS aegypti, and we have one, another one called AIDS albopictus. Both of those are able to transmit this virus. So we will see spread among the continental U.S., although because of our resources, because of our ability to control mosquitoes and our recognition, it will never be the problem that has been through the, through the Caribbean and the Americas. But it will be an issue here, and so it's something to, it's something to think about. And as far as from a global health perspective, it's uh, it's like I can't remember which one of our panelists said said it, but you know any illness that can be acquired any anywhere in the world, you know can present at your doorstep, you know from a plane ride. So, thank you very much. We do have uh, we have time for questions, so there are more comment cards that would be uh, distributed, or maybe an easier way would just be to simply raise your hand and I'll point you out, and you can just stand and, and present your question or comment. Um, we'll go ahead and open up the floor. That's it. Questions, sir? Yes, sir. Any questions? Just one here. Uh, Dr. Pierce said that uh, it wasn't, Zika wasn't common in the United States. I couldn't quite make out on that slide we had where it was found. Was Puerto Rico not a source of Zika? So there have been 300, 312 or something documented cases in the U.S., in continental U.S. There have been about 350 documented cases in U.S. territories, Puerto Rico, American Salmonella, uh, American Samoa, and U.S. Virgin Islands. There is, and there is mosquito-borne transmission in those areas. I was mainly referring to the continental U.S. Other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Is there a vaccine for the Zika virus? But there is no Are they working on it? Are they on the Ebola? Uh, you, you know, I, I don't. I, I don't know. I'm not, honestly not sure. I know they have an Ebola vaccine that's close. I know they have a dengue vaccine that's relatively close. Uh, but Zika, I haven't heard, actually. I, now one of the things I think that they are trying to do uh, in some parts of Brazil is a, uh, which is tricky environmentally, but 
is to introduce the sterile, um, you know, so females have transmitted, so they're introducing the sterile males into uh, communities to see if that can render that type of mosquito uh, population down and obsolete, yeah. But it's tricky when you start doing that, you know, because then they get, they can actually change their, um, their chromosome makeup and immune system or whatever, so. Now, the pharmaceutical companies, do they take this problem seriously and invest in R&D to develop any kind of vaccine? It took a while for them to address the AIDS uh, issue and then, you know, make it available. So, would, would that be a concern? You know, I can't speak for that specifically. Uh, but, I mean, pharmaceutical companies are businesses, and if they see a business opportunity, I, I guarantee they would be all over it. Uh, about the vaccines in general, in general, we are pretty good at making vaccines against some viruses that cause one-time illness. So I'm guessing that we'll, that they're probably working on that, that we'll probably eventually have a Zika virus vaccine. You think about like measles, mumps, and rubella, we pretty much got rid of those because anything that comes in and causes one-time illness and you have lifelong immunity from, that's usually a fairly simple vaccine to make, as opposed to something like malaria, where you can get relapsing or recurrent infections where you don't get lifelong immunity. Those are much more, more difficult to make. So I'm guessing they would. You know, we don't have, the problem with Zika is that with most viruses, we don't have effective antivirals that actually help. And so uh, I, I'm sure that they would look at it just from the standpoint of whether or not it's going to be worth their while. But, but I really can't answer that. I was going to ask, um, with a lot of the media they're covering the upcoming Olympics, can, can you comment on what kind of, where you think things stand on that when they do come around with regards to season? Yeah, you know, the thing, honestly, the, the kind of old-fashioned stuff is, is what actually works. I mean, I think that there'll be a real attempt to keep down the mosquito populations and to educate the public about mosquito avoidance. That's really the real way to avoid the, avoid the illness at this point. There's no you know, again, there's no vaccine, there's no specific treatment, so um, I, I've heard speculation about that, but I don't know. I think I think that would be the thrust of it. Yeah, upstream. But the, and, but the issue, too, with it is it's a day cleaning mosquito. So it's, uh, you know, you're out and about. It's not like you're under a mosquito net, say, for malaria. So I think it does create a lot of fear in people going to Brazil. Um, and then, as you said, Dr. Pierce, the whole issue of, you know, standing water and you no know, sanitation, as you mentioned, Melissa, you know, all of those things contribute to this, this problem. There's also some speculation that the 2014 World Cup is how it got to Brazil. I heard that. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. 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 Now, you guys, you spoke about uh, the RAM for the Calgary City last weekend and the number of people who lined up, some over 800, I heard. And I'm wondering, do you think it would be important for everybody to have some sort of health care service, like uh, both Medicare, Medicaid, Insure Tennessee, and some of those other possibilities to the Affordable Care Act? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, of course, even in um, in the remote uh, areas in Belize, they have they have uh, government health insurance, and so uh, their problem is it's two hours on a bone jarring um, road to get to the nearest clinic. So, um, but yes, uh, people need to be able to. Um, have access to and be able to afford um, health care. And if that means that if this is somebody who is um, working two jobs um, and but neither one of those jobs offer any kind of health care, they they need help. And I, I think it's a moral responsibility that we that we do that. Um, we are we're talking about humans who need help.
You mentioned the medicine. What is the status of the medicine to the people bringing over certain kind of medication? Well, in, in that uh, particular uh, village where we where we were, we we did a um, one of the things that we do is after we uh, do the training with the Ministry of Health worker. Um, we hold a health fair in that person's community. So, um, and the health worker really does it. Like they put it on. And so, um, it's where we do a lot of the screenings: blood pressure, glucose levels. So, we were finding people who had uh, glucose levels um, in the 300s, 400s. We had one guy had a glucose level 600. So, if you don't know glucose, that's really high. So, um, what we did was. Um, we, we got, um, there's an NGO called Hillside Clinic that is um, in, a, in a neighboring town that we, 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 we picked the worst of the, of the worst in terms of the patients and we made sure that they had access to follow up through Hillside. So basically we connected the NGO to the people um, who, who needed it the most. The rest of them, um, it was very cool. We did um, some cooking classes, healthy cooking, upstream prevention, um, avoiding. Uh, they do a lot of corn-based tortillas, and then these things called cocoa yams. It's all it's all um, heavy carb. And so, um, looking at, at these protein sources, plant-based protein sources, it's in, it's incredible. It's so hard to explain, but being that cultural humanity. There are pigs and chickens running all over the place. So you would think protein wouldn't be an issue here, right? But they don't, they don't kill their pigs and chickens, and they uh, very rarely eat the eggs. And so it's so, it's so interesting, because you'll say, well, what do you, what do, you do with them? <laughs> um, and, and you don't really get a good answer. So um, anyway, long story short is um, that, that's, that's kind of what we did. We, we had to prioritize. And then um, we made connections um, for, for the, the people who um, were in real trouble. Very similar to what we do here in, my, uh, yeah. in the United States. People working without benefits who um, normal screening thing. That's one of the issues with screening. There's a lot of ethical questions about that. If you cannot provide follow-up and you're doing screening, uh, what kind of a uh, ethical dilemma is that? It's a problem. Or you can't provide the medicine. You have many, many people that have hepatitis C and they have no benefits. They can't afford the $200,000 treatment. So we don't have the exactly the system that needs to be replicated. <laughs> Maybe we need to think about that, number one, if we think of healthcare to life. But what you're describing is, is happening every day. You all know that here in, um, I, I, in the I, uninsured population. That, yeah, and one thing that um, that was very frustrating for me because I've I've since been back there um, about five times. So June June this June with students um, will be six times that I've been back. And um, you know I tell my students this all the time. Um, interestingly enough, I teach pharmacology, but um, I always say non-farm first. And um, we are a pill-popping nation, and you know what we do when we go down and we um, give medicines like that is we we instill in them that a pill is going to solve their problems, and so we are putting our pill-popping nation um, habit of mind into that population. I think that's what infuriates me the most. Now, as we go around and um, we've done things like. Um, with Peace Corps volunteers, started um, women's softball teams. And actually, Tennessee Tech um, and Gordonsville High School equipped this softball team to get these women out of their huts and, and active. And it is, it is fascinating and fun to watch them play. And they play every week, twice a week. So, um, you know, that, that kind of stuff, the softball teams, the nutrition classes, but there's the same kind of resistance that I see here. 90%-ish of our type 2 our diabetes in this country is preventable diabetes that is caused by health choices. And that, that you know, the, the choice is, well, I'll just pop a pill and it'll be okay versus 
get off your duff and do some exercise <laughs> uh, and, and make and make choices. Although the complication is right, good good food costs more. Anyway, that that the fact that when I go into a village now, they they, they want to know what kind of medicines I brought with me, that makes me angry because somebody has taught them that, and it wasn't their ministry of health. Okay, there's no more. Uh, okay, more so, sorry. Yes, sir. Because I think that's the issue of 
this multidisciplinary approach. And I think, because I've been working in and out of the country for, I hate, I'm now almost 40 years, so is it just, you know, what's causing this disease, but it's also what's happening in the healthcare system and how are they writing their laws and do they have practice acts and do and they need and biostatistics and um, people doing ergonomics and it's a it's a hugely um, diverse area and it depends on the amount of time you want to, to be involved. There are internships with a lot of different agencies, some paid, some not. Um, if you want to do a longer term piece Peace Corps um, is a two-year plus commitment. Um, they also have a Peace Corps response for people who have been professionals. Some of them, are, they want ex-Peace Corps volunteers, but others are open to everyone. Um, and they will give you the training. We expect you to learn the language. And that's a big part of it, too. Uh, you know, part of the world where some of the languages are hard to learn. But that's a great question. And I, I urge everyone to think about it. because. It's, um, there's a lot of pieces to it, whether it's here or, or internationally. And again, the internship piece is, um, is really growing as well. The take home piece, too, is whatever you decide to do, um, service, tourism, volunteerism is a billion dollar industry. And there are a lot of people out there doing things that are not helpful. And so if you do get involved, um, just just do your homework. Who are you traveling with and what are they doing and is it sustainable? I would just I would just really ask those questions. And there's actually research being done in that area um, about um, volunteers and um, what's what's the result of it. <laughs> Yeah, on behalf of Tennessee Tech University and the College of Business, we'd like to thank our panel for 